did. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Unmasked Virtual Town Hall Series. My name is Abba Blankson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Marketing and Communications for the NAACP. We are honored and excited about the experts and leaders for tonight's panel on the coronavirus vaccines and treatment, and we look forward to an informative and engaging conversation. If you want to stay involved with the NAACP or support uh, our social justice work, you can dial star 8 or go to naacp.org to volunteer. For our phone participants, if at any time you have a question, you can dial star 3 to get in the question queue. If you're watching on social media, on YouTube or Facebook, uh, you can leave us a question or comment at NAACP. With that, I'd like to introduce NAACP President and CEO, Derek Johnson. President Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abba. And I want to thank everyone who is joining us this evening. As you can recall, at the beginning of this pandemic, the NAACP, we embarked on a series of Peloton Hall meetings to ensure that our community will be educated and informed on how to navigate the global pandemic. Uh, we later continued that discussion as we realized that it was having a disproportionate impact on the African American community. And unfortunately, with this global pandemic, which was having uh, a national impact on many of our lives, we found ourselves navigating in this space without a true federal response as a result of the current administration. We did our very best to keep the community informed about how best to protect uh, your families, yourselves, and the communities that we come from. Tonight is no difference. We're gonna close out the year with this conversation with some of the experts to assist you in understanding what lies in front of us with the vaccine. No, two vaccines. No, possibly three vaccines that is under consideration, one that has been approved by the FDA. FDA nor the history of the African-American communities and our hesitancy in getting involved with medical experiments, we want to make sure that you are fully aware of how to navigate in this moment with the information as, as it is readily available. We are excited with the panel of experts that's going to be coming before us this evening, and I'm waiting to hear the sound advice that we're going to receive. So thank you, Abba, for uh, setting up this, once again, Peloton Hall meeting. And Thank I guess I'm the person to introduce like April to Ryan. So our, our, our moderator for this evening will be April Ryan, uh, a friend, a member, and an activist for, with NAACP. So thank you, April, for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, everyone, welcome to this teletown hall, unmasked uh, COVID-19 town hall. This is a time where we are looking for information as these vaccines are being dispersed uh, throughout this nation. Uh, millions, millions, tens of millions are infected in this country. Um, hundreds of thousands have died. And without further ado, I want to introduce our panel tonight. Uh, we will have joining us uh, not long into the future, Senator Cory Booker of the state of New Jersey, we also have Dr. Patrice Harris of the American Medical Association, the immediate past president, who will be joining us. Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, the co-chair of President-elect Joe Biden's advisory board on coronavirus. We also have Dr. Kamika Corbett, the senior research fellow, scientific lead at the National Institutes of Health. Donald Alcindor, PhD, associate professor of Meharry Medical College, as well as Dr. Gigi El Boyami, she is a medical professor at GWU, George Washington University, also the director of the Rodham Institute and a member of the Black Coalition Against COVID. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Once again, we are looking to inform and we are looking for layman's terms because we can talk in so cerebral uh, terminologies, but this is impacting people and we want you to understand what's at stake. And I wanna go first with Dr. Mika Corbett. Dr. Corbett, you were in the lab uh, working on this for the last eight, nine months. So can you tell us as it relates to the disbursement of these vaccines? We have Pfizer, we have Moderna, and, and there's another on the horizon. What should we be looking for as we watch 
uh, those who are uh, the the heroes in the in the hospitals trying to save us. What do you think we should be looking for as we watch these vaccines be dispersed? Hi, and um, thanks a lot uh, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here um, to engage with the community in this way. Um, so uh, one thing that I, I do want to step back and just remind people is is that um, the research that we've been doing that has really fueled these vaccines forward in how we consider it to be called rapid way or warp speed is longstanding, actually. Um, I've been scientific lead of the coronavirus team at the NIH for six years now, um, since I graduated from graduate school. So um, the vaccine development that is has been happening for the last several months is something that you're seeing in front of your eyes as something that's happening very rapid. But there's tons of science and data that not only backs what is being expressed by the vaccine, but also the platforms, at least the, the prominent ones, which are the mRNA platforms. So that's just one thing that I wanted to say. And obviously now we are embarking on this moment where the FDA is approving what are considered to be emergency use authorizations. So these are really special authorizations where the FDA says, with what the data we have right now from phase three efficacy trials, can we use these vaccines in some of the most vulnerable populations and those people who are at the highest of risk? And so as those people like healthcare workers, people um, that are elderly or people with uh, 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 more than one comorbidity start to get these vaccines in these early rollouts, the things that you need to that you should be watching as you are deciding in uh, whether you want to get the vaccine when it comes available for general public is how the efficacy data continues to stand. Remembering that the phase three clinical trials are actually continuing to um, to to monitor people both from a safety perspective and also from the efficacy perspective. Um, remembering that my team actually personally is continuing to publish data from the preclinical side and also from the phase one clinical trials. So to continue to monitor the data that, can, that comes out. And if you know a healthcare worker or someone on the front line who is getting the vaccine, to ask those honest questions that people have been asking me, such as what are the side effects? How did you feel after you got the vaccine? Um, how did other people around you feel when they got the vaccine? Have you seen anyone become severely ill? Really try to get real world um explanations on these types of things because i understand actually that these fda packets have tons of language in them very hard to decipher what it means solicited adverse event etc cetera, etc cetera. and it can be confusing but i think that as these vaccines are rolling out getting real life experience and and detail of the experience of vaccine from people that is probably the most important um, level of information that you can have. So once again, if you want to join in on this conversation, please press star three, star three, or send your question to, to Twitter. And and uh, Dr. Corbett, I want to stick with you one more second with one question. I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Uh, Nunez Smith. You talked about the emergency use authorization and that these vaccines are still in uh, the third phase of trials. And we know from history, um, pharma pharmaceutical uh, companies take years in the lab. They take years uh, with the studies, you know, um, phase one, phase two, phase three. What gives the average American, as well as those on the front line, the confidence that this will actually do the trick, that this will not cause something side effect uh, beyond the normal issues of, of taking a vaccine? So I like to categorize that the answer to that question kind of two ways. The first is the science, right? Which is where I stand as a scientific lead, having the data that um, helps to, to push the vaccines forward in, in this way. Over the last six years, we've been studying how to make the best and safe is immune response for coronaviruses actually. So that, and then also this moment is very different um, when you compare it to historical moments when vaccines have been developed. And one of the things that is very different is that the circumstances are extremely dire right now. 
And with that, different organizations and institutions, whether it be from the company side or National Institutes of Health, FDA, et cetera, came together and said, we have an issue. How can we streamline this process to insert different checkpoints along the way that have been the same checkpoints all the time in all vaccine development to ensure that the product that comes out of it at the end is safe and effective, but that we have not skipped one step at all. And so what that meant is that you had a lot of sleepless nights from a lot of different teams um, all over the country, whether it be from the regulatory side or the scientific side. And the other thing that it meant is that there was there were all eyes on deck just as there were all hands on deck. I want people to realize that just because it has been rapid does not mean that there has been any level of irresponsibility in regards to this development. And in fact, the types of criteria that the FDA have been in a stepwise portion, uh, fashion putting into place, allowing the science to drive this actually shows, in my opinion, that the system is working in the, in the favor of the public. For example, understanding that most adverse events for following vaccinations in history have actually happened within the first two months following vaccinations. The FDA got that data together and they said, well, we were not going to approve any vaccine for emergency use until a median of the participants, so about half of the participants in the phase three clinical trial have passed that two month mark. So this is an extremely data-driven and uh, scientifically driven process. And so the vaccine can evolve. So it's not necessarily this is it. It can evolve to something greater. Um, well, I mean, I don't know how much greater you're going to get than 94.1 and 95% efficacy. But what I mean is that as these clinical trials have been going on since March 16th, actually, that was when the first person in the United States with, was injected with Moderna's vaccine candidate. As these clinical trials has, have been going on, that these stages of these clinical trials and the outcomes of these clinical trials and what the FDA requires to move to the next step has been driven by science and nothing else. And that's what I mean. And, and so what you're seeing now with these emergency use authorizations is that there's a solid amount of data from phase three clinical trials that inform the FDA around the safety and efficacy of these vaccines, so much so that they can say, we trust these vaccines to be used immediately based on 95% effic efficacy and no severe safety signals in any large amount to be used Im immediately in these vulnerable populations so we can try to start to um, change the dynamic of the transmission in this pandemic. Right, um, and we have Senator Cory Booker, Senator from uh, New Jersey on. We just wanna say hello to you first and then we're gonna come back, Senator Booker, hello, how are you? Okay, your your mic is not on. Hello, Senator Booker. I apologize, April, I'm sorry. I know this uh, you know newly talented, newly named uh, Grio uh, reporter. I can't. I got to bring my A game when I'm dealing with you. I apologize. That's right. White House correspondent for the Grio. All right. Yes. So we will be back to you in two seconds. But I want to go to Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith, co-chair of the President-elect Joe Biden's advisory board on the coronavirus. Can you give us an update, Dr. Nunez Smith, as we currently are sitting in uh, the, the the vaccinations of frontline workers. Can you give us an update on what's happening and what you anticipate starting January 20, 2021? Perfect. Thank you so much. And it's great to be here with, with everyone. Thank you to NAACP for hosting this event. And if I might just to take a moment to say thank you to Dr. Corbett uh, and your team and to all of the scientists who've worked so hard to get us to this place. And I really just want to echo, uh, you know, this this moment of just great optimism and hope as we realize that uh, not just one, likely two plus vaccine candidates uh, on the horizon and that we start this week with vaccination for people who are on the front line and at great risk, um, as was pointed out. And I think it's a huge accomplishment. I feel very confident, as uh, Dr. Corbett said that she does, uh, and many others do, that the political interference risk was really removed 
we had scientists reviewing the data in terms of the vaccines and their signals around how safe they are, uh, the efficacy, that's really how well they work. And that, that means how well they work in keeping people from getting uh, very sick from, uh, from COVID-19. So this is a, a very momentous time for us. Um, we have to also balance this optimism uh, and this light at the end of the tunnel with the reality that at the moment we are in great surge across the country. Uh, we are meeting and breaking just the most grim of milestones. And so even as we recognize the vaccine and the promise of the vaccine as one important tool in the toolbox, we have to really be thinking as well about all the things we know that we have to continue doing in terms of keeping our mask on, uh, small groups and gatherings, social distancing, uh, washing our hands frequently, um, all of that. And also I think keeping our eye on the promise of more available uh, increased testing, the ability for people to be able to, if they need to, quarantine and isolate uh, at home and try to remove barriers for people who, who now uh, aren't able to do that successfully. You know, for us to keep our eye on new therapies on the horizon. And I think for the Biden-Harris team, you know, it's a great honor for, for me to be here really representing the reality that everyone is centering the work on equity. Uh, and there's a commitment to equitable and efficient distribution of the vaccine. Uh, but we're also keeping our eye on things like testing and things like, like treatment. We have to ensure equity uh, in those domains as well. All right. And uh, Senator Cory Booker, I want to go to you next. Um, there's been a lot of lessons learned in this moment uh, as it relates to uh, how to handle this uh, life and death situation. Uh, what is Congress prepared to do? What it, what's the Senate prepared to do come January 20 when the mentality and actual the people and leadership change as it relates to making sure that this uh, 70%, 70 to 80% of Americans are uh, actually vaccinated. Well, April, it's great to be on with you tonight. And for the second time, we were on earlier talking about a bill that I have called Justice for Black Farmers and had a chance to talk about some of these very uh, important conversations, which makes me want to thank uh, President Derek Johnson all the more for not just his leadership during this pandemic, but for making sure that we are staying connected to each other with real talk and invaluable information. And so when it comes to Congress uh, acting, we know that when Joe Biden swears his oath to become the next president of the United States and Kamala Harris the next vice president, we're gonna still be in the middle of this pandemic. And in fact, we will be probably deep in crisis as we're seeing hospitalizations right now reach record highs and deaths per day, reach staggering numbers, how this crisis has already become the third largest mass casualty event in American history. And unfortunately, we know that this mass casualty event is affecting vulnerable populations, black and brown communities, native communities. And this is something that the Biden-Harris team will have to be taking on front and center in their agenda. And us in Congress at the same time, we are control the purse strings. And what I've been pushing for is really robust funding, especially for those jurisdictions uh, that are most in crisis to be able to distribute this vaccine. We need to make sure that state and local communities have the money to get the job done. And as the medical officials on this panel can probably speak to better than I can, there are a lot of lo logistics that really go on from getting a vaccine from a plant into someone's arm. Uh, states and jurisdictions are gonna have to get, their, get the resources they need to recruit and train thousands of healthcare workers to modernize data and tracking systems, to stand up vaccine sites and so much more. Without that robust funding, uh, I fear that some places will see similar hiccups and barriers uh, that we did and still do as, as we try to roll out our, a comprehensive testing regime. And so we know that when these barriers are, are erected or, or the challenges are faced, they're most difficult when it comes to black and brown communities and low income and poor communities. And so I, I want you to know what I'm calling for, uh, which is that more, those more resources to empower local trusted organizations 
and communicators as we move forward. And so uh, I'm grateful for people like Sandra Lindsay, the nurse who was the first person uh, to receive the vaccine in the U.S., and Dr. Corbett here tonight uh, for leading uh, and the development of the Moderna vaccine at the NIH, who are among the many Black women who are leading this fight. And I want you to know that this past June, uh, another member of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congresswoman Robin Kelly and I introduced the Community Solutions COVID-19 Act, which would create a grant program to help grassroots organizations create and expand upon programs to eliminate the inequities uh, that are so prevalent in our healthcare outcomes as it relates to COVID-19. And I'm hopeful that our bill and similar legislation can not only be included in the stimulus package we're working on right now, but can be part of the empowering resources put forward so that the Biden-Harris team uh, from the executive branch uh, could help us to uh, really meet the challenges of getting ourselves out of this uh, pandemic here in the United States. Do you have buy-in from Mitch McConnell and Republicans? Um, right now, we're, we're in the midst of negotiations, and I'll be frank with you. We do not have the buy-in uh, to do this at the level that we need to. Uh, where we are negotiating right now, around $900 billion, is far short of the resources we need to meet the extent of this pandemic. And you're seeing the, the, the numbers and the areas being covered. Some of them are good, but they're not to the degree we need for food aid, not to the degree that we need uh, for our hospitals, not the, to the degree we need for our state and local governments. Uh, we're not seeing the level of resources and funding we need in the midst of this crisis. And as I said to you on our Instagram Live, April, we are, we are the wealthiest nation on the planet Earth, but our peer nations from Japan to Germany are doing so much more uh, we're arguing over a package of about $900 billion, and I think the Japanese just finished a package for a much smaller country of over $700 billion. We are not putting enough resources out there, uh, and uh, I'm hoping uh, this is why Georgia is so critically important, because if we win in Georgia, then, then uh, 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 soon-to-be President Biden and Vice President Harris will have a Senate better positioned to help them to do big things, not only to help deal with the immediacy of the pandemic, but also to help us, as he says, to build back better, to make strategic investments so that our communities can not only deal with the health crisis, but also uh, the economic crisis and turn this dark period into one of light. And so let's just be clear, some of that funding that you're talking about would actually go to the NIH to help Dr. Corbett just, just further study this issue, this deadly virus that we are in the grips of right now, correct, Senator? Um, right now, there's not that much money for the NIH uh, uh, really being discussed, I'll be honest uh, with you, and not adequate. And, and I think there's something, and this is where I know Kamala, because I've worked, excuse me, uh, right. Vice President-elect Harris um, uh, and I have worked together on these uh, issues. I'm trying here, April, April and I have been having, having a talk about this. Uh, you, you go from somebody who's your colleague and your sister who to now uh, you gotta is the give history. Him the title. Give him the title. Give him the title. She, she, more, she, more, she more than earned it. And she's uh, going to become one of our country's great history makers very, very soon. Uh, but she and I have worked on these issues of uh, racial disparities in healthcare outcomes and healthcare access. And I'm confident from my conversation with Joe Biden that this is going to be part of their agenda. This COVID vaccine, this COVID virus, excuse me is laying bare the deeper inequalities, structural inequalities in our country that have to be addressed, not just for those who are suffering the dis disparate health outcomes, but if we are together to be a successful nation, we cannot have large parts of our population uh, have such uh, inequality when it comes to healthcare outcomes and healthcare access. All right, well, let's go to questions. We've got a lot of people who have questions and we still gonna ask questions of our panelists Press star three if you have questions. You are joining us for the Unmasked a COVID-19 Town Hall. I'm your moderator, April Ryan, White House correspondent for The Brio. Abba, let's go to a call. Yes, April, we have Rowena with a question. Rowena, you're yes. on live. Go ahead with your question. Yes, 
if someone tests positive the crime and they have a natural immunity, how long does that last and should they still get the vaccine? Okay. Who can answer that? Um let's go to let's go to Dr. Gigi Elguinami. That's a great question. And uh the reality is we don't know exactly. Uh, but the current recommendations, it's, you know, is to go ahead and immunize, even if you've had the COVID uh, virus itself. Um, this is the part where we're learning. And I just want to add to this idea of why should we trust the vaccine? And as a member of the uh, Black Coalition Against COVID, I would really direct you to our website, blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org because these are questions that will be answered with more scientific and clinical information. Um, and so please keep an eye on that. Uh, it is being studied right now. Right now it's felt to be in the range of maybe two to three months because uh, you know, when we are able to measure uh, the antibody, but the jury is still out. Mm. Dr. Uh, Alcindor, I wanna ask you yes, that I, as well. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Yes, so some people will not make neutralizing antibodies. Well, some people will. Coronavirus is in terms of duration of immunity can be short-lived. And so this is a question that has to be answered in the future, but they want you to get the vaccine. And the reason being is that if your neutralizing antibody has waned over time, Getting the vaccine is likely to boost your immune response further and offer you protection that you did not have or has waned during the natural infection process. Well, there's also a concern about those who could be allergic to this. Um, who, who is at risk? Who should not take this? Can someone, who would like to answer that, please? You know what, I'm gonna go to Dr. Corbin, because you're in the lab with it. I'm gonna go back to you, Dr. Corbin. This is your, this is, we have celebrated your excellence. And I say that, and I, and I want to give you your flowers because I say to people, I said, we, this is not the first time black people have been in the lab. And it's been before Charles Drew, but we celebrate you tonight. And I want to go to you. Who should not be taking this vaccine? Right. And I actually want to just piggyback on what was previously said about the antibody response, actually, because we published a slew of data alongside the phase one clinical trial data where people who got the vaccine 100 percent of people got whopping neutralizing antibodies so these are antibodies that have the ability to kill virus so if you get vaccinated it's likely that you will be in the 100 percent of people who have really high levels of those as opposed to after natural infection about one third or one fourth of people do not get those types of antibodies at all and so you're really playing Russian roulette with natural immunity as opposed to more guaranteed immunity from the vaccine. Um, so I just I just really had to drive home. I'm all about I'm, I'm a scientist. So I'm all about driving home the data um, in a very dissectable way. Um, and then in regarding the allergies uh, and the anaphylaxis that has been seen um, following some of the initial uh, immunizations with Pfizer's vaccines is that these people had history of severe allergies. And unfortunately, a large subset of those types of people were not in the phase three clinical trials enough to make any generalizable type of a recommendation around people with, with severe allergies. And so as we get more and more data, I'm sure that the FDA will inform people on whether or not, if you have severe allergies, whether or not you should get the vaccine. Right now, the recommendation, at least in the UK, is that you should not get the vaccine if you have severe allergies or at least be prepared um, with your EpiPen if you so choose. Because again, all inclusively, getting vaccinated is always your informed choice. Um, and so this is something that is not really a cause of concern because it happened in people who had a history of these types of reactions, whether it be from uh, severe food reactions uh, or allergies, et cetera. And it did not happen in just your normal um, person who had never had any allergic reaction before. Okay, thank you. 
All right, so let's go back to the phone lines. People are really, we've got a long line of questions and that's just showing how much people are engaged in this moment. This is a life or death moment. So Abba, let's go to the phone line. Uh, we have a question from Lesby, Maryland or Linthica, Maryland. Go ahead with your yes. question. Hi, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have a three-part question. I'll make it real quick. Um, my question is, with the release of various vaccines from several manufacturers and rather quickly, what are the differences between them? The second question is, do you have the option of which to take, or is it a random, is it random based on where your vaccination is given? And then the last question is, is there tracking of which vaccination individuals are given in case there are future side effects that need to be treated? Dr. Harris, those are excellent questions. Dr. Harris? Those are excellent questions, and I will probably uh, defer to uh, Dr. Corbett on one. Uh, but April, you mentioned uh, something at the very beginning of the hour that I think is very important, and this session is about information and data and science. And I'm so glad uh, that everyone's engaged because the folks on this call are giving you data and science with which uh, to make your decisions. I also just have to take a moment. I am a psychiatrist and I know there have been lots of issues around mental health raised um, during this pandemic. And my patients and others have asked, you know, what can we do? And the one thing I recommend is don't miss the moments, those moments of hope and inspiration. And so April, you've said it already about Dr. Corbett, and I'm so honored to be on the panel with her, and she certainly uh, deserves our praise. But I think it's important to see her and hear her as we discuss issues around mistrust. And I think it's also important uh, that we elevate uh, Dr. Nunez Smith. I was moved yes. uh, when she spoke, spoke from the platform of the presidency the president-elect and the vice president-elect and amplified terms that we've heard before, but I think made so much more powerful because of the platform, uh, minoritized and marginalized communities. That's how we should be talking about this. She talked about the social determinants of health. Uh, she talked about structural racism. And so I think it's important that uh, we appreciate the context of all of that information um, as we discuss uh, COVID-19 and vaccines tonight. Uh, so two of the vaccines, uh, of course, and Dr. Corbett uh, worked on one of these, uh, used messenger RNA. And I will let, let Dr. Corbett talk about the scientific uh, aspect of that, but I think of it in a very uh, lay terms. And these vaccines teach your body how to respond if and when you were to encounter uh, the real virus. And so uh, they, they make sure that you're ready. Uh, it's a protein, it's not the virus, it's just a piece of the virus. We've all seen uh, photos of the virus with that protein. And so your body is then prepared uh, to fight off the coronavirus if you should uh, become infected. And uh, right. the third, uh, Yes, and so I wanted, to, and I will turn it over to Dr. Corbett to give information about uh, the third uh, vaccine. Yes, Dr. Corbett, I'm gonna go back to Dr. Gigi as well on this as well. Go ahead, Dr. Corbett, yes. Um, I'm assuming that you all are talking about the AstraZeneca candidate, um, which also is only using the same piece of the coronavirus, which is a, it's called the spike protein, so it's just, one protein from the virus, not the whole virus. The cool technology around AstraZeneca's candidate and actually also Johnson & Johnson's candidate while we're here and talking about it, um, is that they take the guts out of a normal cold virus called an adenovirus. So they remove all of the material that would make it a make it an effective virus and they put that spike protein inside. And so basically they're using the outside of a, a common cold virus to express a coronavirus spike protein. So the common cold virus kind of alerts your immune system. And then once your immune system is alerted, the, uh, the, the spike protein is there so it can teach your immune system what the spike protein of a coronavirus looks like. So that's the really nifty trick that AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson are using. Okay, and Dr. Gigi? 
Yes, I think that uh, one of the things about this new virus is that it's very sneaky. It kind of comes in and the body is not really able to detect it. And that's why it can be so devastating. So as was mentioned, it is about teaching your system to react to it, to contain it. I wanted to just add a couple of things which are so important in assuring that the people who are currently suffering from COVID or who might get infected uh, before uh, they get vaccinated is that things like food matter. Uh, food is one of the strongest social determinants of, of health and mental health specifically. Don't forget to make sure that if you have other conditions such as diabetes or HIV or chronic conditions, I actually just completed my uh, cancer treatment for kidney cancer, that you are controlling everything that you possibly can. And then let's not forget about other vaccines that are available. Uh, influenza, of course, and pneumonia vaccine, because what you don't want to happen is to get the flu, which makes you susceptible to getting another virus or another infection. Um, but I, I, I want to underscore something which really has to do with trust. I think that you are seeing the, the, this illustrious panel that represents a variety of different uh, groups um, and, and, and expertise. And to see that black people and people of color are involved and are keeping an eye uh, on exactly what's happened is super important and should really bring um, trust. And I'm, I'm happy to say that with these educational forums, the acceptance rate for getting a COVID vaccine among African-Americans is actually beginning to increase. So let's keep that dialogue moving. Well, you know, um, I think you hit the nail squarely when you talked about a trust issue. And I want to throw that out before I go to the next question with Alba. Um, in the Black community, there is an issue of trust. We know about Tuskegee. We know about so many other issues when it comes to health. We also know about the health disparities uh, with the races in this nation as it relates to just going to a doctor and getting the right diagnosis or having the right kind of uh, follow-up care. What I'm, I'm throwing this out to anyone who wants to answer. What would you say about history versus now when it comes to trust in this vaccine as we are in this emergency youth use authorization moment. Anyone? Well, I will. Uh, that's why the and Black Coalition COVID. against the, this is why the Black Coalition Against COVID was started by Dr. Reed Tuxen, former DC Health Commissioner, as well as president of Char, former president of Charles Drew. It involves the four historically Black medical schools, as well as sectors of labor and education. Um, as well as business. And so having a group that really is dedicated to assuring the best quality care, vetting information about clinical trials and vaccines, I think is crucial because of this issue of distrust, mistrust, which yeah. I think everybody on this panel can certainly understand. Dr. Harris? Yes, and I, always like to emphasize that this mistrust is earned. And so just as the mistrust has been earned, we can certainly go in and earn trust, but we have to make sure uh, that it's not a one and done proposition. Uh, certainly you see evidence of African-Americans on this panel who are highlighting the science, highlighting our trust. I have said uh, that as soon as it is my turn, I do plan to get the vaccine. Uh, but now we have to redouble our efforts. You heard I call her Dr. Gigi uh, talk about another uh, coalition of folks that are working on this. Of course, the NAACP by making sure that we all get accurate information. And so I think we have to continue to do that uh, there are issues in the past, but there are issues in the present, and we need to continue to work in our communities uh, during the pandemic, but we have to continue that um, after we get through uh, this pandemic. And I want to highlight one other thing, because I've seen a couple of issues confused. This mistrust that has been earned is not the same 
as the misinformation uh, that has been put out there uh, by the anti-vaccine community. So I want to make mm -hmm. sure that people are clear those are two separate issues. Yeah, you're right, misinformation. And there was a study by the Knight Foundation and Gallup when it came to COVID. Uh, the, the, the number one uh, uh, piece of misinformation, well, it was, I don't, I know that the president of the United States was number two. Social media was up there as well. And when you have mistrust or misinformation or both dueling together from the leader of your country, that causes a ripple effect throughout the nation that we've seen as well, because that goes to mass wear. Now, I want to go back to uh, Gigi. Um, we need to, not Gigi, excuse me, Abba. We need to go to Abba and uh, go to calls. We got a lot of people. Let's go. Star three, if you want to talk, if you need information, this is an informative session. It's called Unmasked, a COVID-19 town hall. We are getting information. We have got the people here. We have got the the doctor who is in the lab working with this. And we are so honored to have you, uh, Dr. Corbett. We really are. And it's, it's an honor to know that, as Dr. Gigi said, we have someone who looks like us. Who's watching us? You know, actually, I actually want to, I, I actually want to speak to that point because you you highlighted something that is important to note. Um, mind you, you know, the history is the history, and the history is what got us to this point where there is this what I would consider to be the onus of us um, on the side of the science and the vaccine developers to earn the 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 trust back. But some of the things that are different as you compare today. To history is number one um a large amount of effort was put into ensuring that this process every step of the way had the eyes of people of color in it so uh dr james hildreth for example the ceo and president of Meharry, actually sits on the board and is reviewing data packages from my own personal vaccine um, you know, tomorrow to say whether or not it can get emergency use authorization. Um, on the side of the science, obviously, I serve as a scientific lead for the National Institutes of Health team. And there are just tons of places in this process where the eyes of people of color. And also, one of the things, although I am completely not a fan of the misinformation, but one of the things that social media has done is that it has heightened the accountability. So one of the things that became very clear, particularly, and I'm just going to speak from my own uh, personal standpoint, is in our phase one clinical trial, only having 4% of African Americans in the phase one clinical trial was actually the only embarrassing thing that has, has happened for this vaccine effort from my standpoint. And so at that point, it became clear that if we were going to be able to sit on panels like this and tell people of color that the vaccine is safe and effective for them, that we needed to increase the representation of those people in color and people with comorbidities, et cetera, in the phase three clinical trial. So Moderna started first because we helped to drive that product into phase one clinical trial in 66 days. But Moderna's phase three numbers were not on par with where we would like to have seen them. And so Moderna CEO actually agreed to slow down enrollment so that we could get better representation of people of color in the phase three wow. clinical trial. And I actually looked at the um, FDA package when I was reading it, and I was just happy, actually, because it was at about 6% Black enrollees in the phase three clinical trials. And it was like, no, we're pumping the brakes, and we're going to at least try to get up to 10%. Could it be better? Yes, it could match the population of this country at about 14%, but we aren't there yet. But what I want people to understand is that we are at least trying. And I also want people to understand that it is at no fault of yours that you do not trust a system that has done you and your ancestors wrong for hundreds of years. And that the questions that you ask, as long as they are um, respectable and that and they come from a place of genuinely caring about your health and the health of your community, I think that it is on us to continue to answer this, those questions in forums just like these. And so I just wanted to point out a, just a couple of very small things that are different. But, you know, people are like, well, why does it why does it matter that she's black? It matters because I'm getting invitations from everybody in the world right now to come talk to them, 
via Zoom to their group of scientists. And I have said, I am not taking an absolutely any invitation until you can tell me that the community is invited. I have Caltech inviting the community. I have Harvard's inviting the community. That is why it matters that we are embedded in this process so that our work not only fuels the development of these vaccines and these treatments, but also that our work shines and so that our community is just as informed as everyone else. Wow, Dr. Alcindor, we just heard something so major from Dr. Corbett. That was impactful. Yeah. Let me tell you, that was newsworthy, what you just said. Yeah. Um, it was very newsworthy. Worthy. Dr. Alcindor, um, listening to Dr. Corbett, she's basically saying that, you know, things have changed since years ago with the mistrust in, in clinical trials for us. Talk to that issue of Black people now getting involved in trials for our own collective good, for issues, not just for COVID, but sickle cell, which there's still no cure for other diseases that impact us greater than the other communities. So when, when this pandemic started, we felt that the historically Black colleges had a very important place. It was a call to action for historically Black colleges. And Meharry joined on June 30th, the Vaccine Trial Network. And they were going to enroll community members in a study of vaccine candidates as a part of Project Warp Speed. And I did uh, come in and started to serve as a community liaison, as a dissemination specialist, as a person who was both a scientist and a person that would meet communities where they are, meaning that I was originally trained as a molecular virologist. And I would go into barbershops and salons, and I would go to churches and talk to retired military and all of those people and find out what their needs were in terms of questions they had about a vaccine. And so at Florida Project Warp Speed, Meharry is in the process of participating in a clinical trial. We are there to protect populations against COVID-19 and to be a proponent for the health and wellness of communities of color. And so at Meharry, we have three testing sites throughout Nashville. We have testing laboratories that have been supported by the Gates Foundation and Thermo Fisher Scientific. The targeted populations are populations from our community. That is people with underlying medical conditions, people that have a greater risk of exposure at their jobs, people that work in elderly care facilities, people that are older than age 65, folks that work in prisons and jails, and of course, indigenous populations, including African-Americans and Latinx people. Our recruitment goals have been met about 85%. We're trying to get 300 people. And again, we have compensation for some of those folks if they complete the trial. We want to target this idea of the fears. And so we tell the patients that they don't get infected with this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, and you can't come down with a COVID-19 illness if you get the vaccine. And of course, the interest, I want to say out, is that anybody living in the Nashville area that is interested in participating in our trials, please uh, contact Dr. Vladimir Berto at 615-327-5753. The vaccine is given in two doses, that's 21 uh, days apart. If you plan to get the flu vaccine, you should get the flu vaccine at least five days before you get our vaccine. And so you are given, you are followed for two years. You're given an electronic diary that you can document all every type of adverse event you might have. And of course, uh, you have to give blood samples quarterly. And so this is something that, that's very important. There's another issue that I want to bring up tonight, and that is there's a number of people that are infected already. And we know that a vaccine will not help people that are already infected. And so you have to have other kinds of treatments for people that are hospitalized. And one of these treatments that we have been involved with is the pass it on treatment. This stands for passive immunity trial of our nation. And again, this is sponsored through the Coordinating Center at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. This was funded by Dolly Parton and the National Center for Advanced Translational Sciences. They, have, or they are set out to enroll 1,000 participants at 51 sites throughout the United States. They initially have 19 sites that are currently active. 
and they have 395 participants that are currently enrolled here in the U.S. The trial is designed to include underserved populations that are at the greatest risk for developing the more severe symptoms of COVID-19. And again, if you are injured in any way by this vaccine that can be directly proven, then you and your insurance would not have to pay. You would be able to get treatment at Vanderbilt for, for any kind of adverse events. Well, and again, you. the treatment will be convalescent plasma. And convalescent plasma is plasma that's taken from a person that's recovered from COVID-19. And that can be used because that plasma has antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that can help a person that's sick and in the hospital recover. And so thank you so much. Thank you so much, plasma. Dr. Okay. Dr. Asunder, thank, thank you so much. That's that's good information. And it's also important to note that um, there are uh, schools, HBCUs, uh, Xavier, as well as Dillard in New Orleans, two schools in New Orleans that the presidents are part of trials as well as uh, pushing the students. And we want to get to the phone one more time, um, at least one more time before we uh, conclude this, this, this impactful, important, informative town hall session. Abba? Uh, we have Linda in Bloomfield. Linda, go ahead with your question. My question has to do, what is the youngest age in which you recommend either one or any of these vaccinations to be given to young people? And are there methods where, you know, some public school systems do have nurses and doctors that go out because the children don't always have um, any more um, medical care other than just at certain grades where they have to take their immunizations, period? All right, let's thank you for the call, caller. Um, who would like to answer that question? So I will answer that question. The CDC yes, recommends 16 and over for the Pfizer vaccine. And as of now, the Pfizer vaccine is the only one that has been given EUA. So 16 years old and older. In Pfizer's study, they did include younger people as young as 12 years old in their study, but there was too few of those individuals who were that young. And the CDC is authorizing 16 years and older for the Pfizer vaccine. And I think it's clear that in the future, probably just like every other immunization for children that go to public school, you will probably have to get this COVID-19 vaccine before going to public school in the future. Wow. So, and, and I wanna hit a couple of points. Um, uh, Dr. Gigi, um, we were in conversation not long ago um, and what people don't understand, COVID is such a destroyer. Um, after, uh, if you can go into some of the information that you were talking about with COVID, um, about how there is a cognitive issue. Uh, we're finding later on that there's a cognitive issue with some younger people as well, you get it. Also that there is, um, months later, there could be some organ issues. Can you speak on that uh, synopsis of a synopsis if you can? Of course, of course. Um, I think that one of the very negative roles that the administration has played is to really downplay the effects of COVID. Um, yes, there are people who are asymptomatic, and yes, there are people that really don't uh, have long-term or mid-term <laughs> kinds of consequences, but we know that there's a subgroup of people. It seems to be more common in, in women, and we're, le we're learning why, that have what's called the long hauler symptoms, which include continued chest pain, continued episodes of, of shortness of breath, as well as brain fog. We know that 50% of people who infected with COVID were learning that can have the heart affected. We don't know yet how long these symptoms last. Um, and we have some previous experience with other viruses, such as the viruses that cause chronic fatigue, for example, so some of these long hauler symptoms, we're projecting that they may last as long as two years. So the downplaying of, of oh, it's just a mild thing and most people are going to do fine uh, are not true. Now, you add people with chronic medical conditions such as HIV, there was just a paper that came out, I think today, uh, cancer, active cancer treatment, asthma, uh, you know, diabetes, et cetera, 
that those risks of having severe disease and dying from the disease are significant. You can get blood clots to the brain, you can get blood clots. You just heard that the former or the chief of security at the White House just had part of his leg amputated from a severe COVID infection. And the few children that get infected with COVID and seriously infected um, are actually super, super sick. Um, so, you know, these are, I don't want to scare people, but I just want to put in perspective why we're talking about vaccines today, why we're talking about protecting yourself, why we're talking about uh, physical distancing, especially during the holidays, mask wearing and hand washing. And this is why I respect Dr. Alcindor so much through his whole call he had on his mask. Thank you. And <laughs> that's what we have to do. It, it's not a joke. But we literally have to find the protections, you know, to, to, to keep ourselves um, safe. And I want to go back to you, Dr. Nunez Smith. <sighs> Vice President elect, not, not Vice President elect, President elect Joe Biden wants people to wear masks. Um, it is not a mandated thing, is it? Or, or tell me, tell me about this because this is a lifesaver. Talk to me about this, this, this effort that he wants us to go through wearing a mask once he comes into office. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. The, you know, the president elect has asked us all to make that commitment to continue wearing a mask. We know that people are tired so many months into this. You know, we call it COVID fatigue and everyone wants to, to get back to normal. But we're looking for a new normal on the other side of the pandemic in this build back better world. And for us to get there and for us to get their safety, we have to continue to do some of some of these basic public health things, such as wearing our mask. You know, the kind of mask that you wear does matter as well. So I want to encourage people that as we're talking about masks, it's not just any face covering. And we want to make sure that you're having wearing a mask that is at least to apply, it could be cloth um, or not, but you know, avoid things like the fleece uh, covering or putting a shirt up only. It's really important that we um, are very consistent in how we wear the mask. Too often I see people walking around in stores and other places where the mask is below the nose, for example. So you wanna cover your nose and your mouth at all time. And really and truly it's whenever you're outside your home or even inside your home, if there is someone who is high risk. In our house where you know some of us have to leave and we have a multi-generational home as so many do, you know, we wear masks in the house to help keep the folks uh, safe who are high risk who live in our house. So the mask, we have great evidence there. The data are there, the mask will save lives. So we're asking you, the president elect is asking, this isn't a mandate. This is about the generosity and care that we have for ourselves, our loved ones, our communities, um, our families, and really our healthcare workers. I, I beseech everyone as a practicing internal medicine doctor that we should all do our part to help protect and preserve the healthcare system. And that is about the doctors and nurses, the respiratory therapists. When we wear the mask, we honor and respect them as well. So just a little bit longer we're asking people to continue doing those things to make that sacrifice to have a socially distanced but happy holiday season this year thank you um dr nunez smith i want to go back to dr corbett you know i keep going back to you because you are our promise for this moment and i'm asking you listening to dr nunez smith the reality 70 to 80 percent of people must get vaccinated for us to to breathe easier maybe take off the mask how long is that going to be and please please give us the unadulterated truth you know one of the things that really stood out from what was just said is that um she talked a little bit about just the selflessness of wearing masks and how sometimes it might not be about you but about the people that are around you that are more vulnerable, et cetera. And you know, that's actually how I think about vaccines too. I get a lot of, well, you know, I'm not really in the high risk category. And if vaccines really work, then like, why do you even need more people to take them? Like if you, if you take it, then why do I take it if vaccines work? Vaccines work 
when there are a large amount of the population that gets vaccinated, as was uh, just cited, 60 or 70 percent of people in a population that is vaccinated that can create what is called herd immunity or population immunity. So basically what this does is it really just impedes the level of transmission in the community to the point where the virus that's causing the pandemic or the outbreak starts to die out. So what my fear is that we will start to see herd immunity in certain communities, but might not be seeing herd immunity in other communities. And so then the pandemic stays alive in some communities and starts to die out in other communities. And those communities where the, the pandemic is still running very rampant might be forgotten in the long run. And so, so does I that like mean to think it about needs to be global? It, does that mean it, vaccination needs to be something that is equitable? As Dr. Nunez Smith ver put very eloquently, um, in order for vaccination to really work on the level of which we want it to work, to really get us back to the place where we can live our, our normal lives again, vaccination needs to be equitable. And also remembering that some people just cannot get vaccines. For example, right now, children cannot get vaccinated because they're, they haven't really been fully tested with the vaccines. The FDA hasn't approved it for them. You know, there are vulnerable populations that might fall out of vaccinology, right? There are people who have very severe allergies, right? We're finding out that they might not be the best candidates for vaccines. And so you getting your own personal vaccine is not just about preventing disease for yourself. Getting vaccinated is about doing your part to be someone who cannot really take up the space in the dyna dynamics of transmission in your community. That is really what vaccinations are about at the end of the day. And so I, I think that that is probably the best closing point that could be made around this uh, entire conversation around, around vaccines is that, you know, when you are living in this type of event, this pandemic, sometimes, and by way of just getting us out of it, it the actions that you do, you take, whether it be wearing a mask, socially distancing for you know the holiday season for one year, et cetera. Sometimes those actions are you stepping outside of yourself and just saying, let us all just kind of get through this together so we can get to the next stage and get to our to what I actually want to be a new normal. Because if we're gonna if we're gonna rise above, then let's rise above and actually be better than we were before. But um yeah. Vaccines are not just about you, but they're for your community. I thank you for that. I thank you so much. Well, tonight, everyone, this has been such an informative conversation. Um, unmasked a COVID town hall. We've learned so much from Senator Cory Booker, Dr. Patrice Harris, American Medical Association, uh, Dr. Uh, Marcella Nunez Smith, co chair of President elect Joe Biden's advisory board on coronavirus. Also, Dr. Mika Corbett, Senior Research Fellow, Scientific Lead at the National Institutes of Health. I cannot say that more, the Scientific Lead. We are so proud of you. Um, also, thank you, Dr. Uh, Donald Alcindor, the Associate Professor of Meharry Medical School. Dr. Gigi El uh, uh, she is the professor at George Washington University. Also, she's the director of the Rodham Institute and the member of the Black Coalition Against COVID. Uh, President Johnson, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, I've learned a lot tonight, and this has been something that our people need, all people need. It's about information. That's what I try to do, disseminate it, and there you have it. I want to make one quick comment. Thank you. Yes, sir, go ahead, real yes. fast. And the comment synopsis is, is synopsis. That... <laughs> For typhoid, it took us 105 years to get a vaccine. For polio virus, 47 years. I just want to say to Dr. Corbett, thank you for your service. Amen. 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 Thank you. Take us to church now. So thank you. Mr. President. That's right. Thank you, April, for hosting this wonderful conversation. The NAACP, we're committed to bring this type of information as this global pandemic has had an impact on how we uh, move about. And as we approach this holiday season, some of us will not be able to celebrate with our loved ones in present. Uh, 
but as we've held this virtual conversation, uh, we must also take the precautions necessary. I love what Dr. Nunez said, be kind to your neighbor, wear a mask. That's the kindest thing you can do in the midst of this. And I love the last statement where it was said that, that vaccinations need to be equitable. And, and it's about equity is uh, what we do with NAACP and sharing equitable information as we navigate in this moment. For the NAACP, we thank all of you who have joined us this evening. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I have learned a lot. I have readjusted my thinking around the necessity of getting the vaccine. I hope you have shared in learning so much from these, this wonderful panel. If you look at the panel, it looked like the black community and that's what I'm most proud about. Have a wonderful holiday season. I hope that we can reconvene at the top of the year of 2021, which is gonna be so much better than 2020, so that we can continue to <laughs> share this great information and move forward as a collective whole to make democracy work, to keep our communities safe, and to ensure our families are healthy. Good night. Good night. Good night.